It seems no one knows why Christmas crackers always contain a, a paper crown. I'm not going to put it on, but you know what they look like, don't you? Uh, silly hats have been part of human celebrations for eons, but in my 15 minutes of internet research, and so I'm, I'm now an expert on this, from what I can tell, there's no answer as to why tissue paper crowns have been an essential part of Christmas celebrations since last century. Uh, like many of the modern trend traditions that have sprung up around Christmas, uh, we don't know why, but it's not a bad tradition, is it? Crowns are appropriate at Christmas because the historical biblical record of Jesus' birth features kings. Uh, the part of Matthew's record of Jesus' birth that Brent just read for us is about the three wise men or the three kings, and there are at least three kings in this passage, either explicitly or in the background. There are, there are three kings, but maybe not the ones we might imagine. Uh, the most obvious king is the one who looks like a king and sadly acts like every other king or political ruler, and he is Herod. Uh, when the visitors arrive from the east looking for the king of the Jews, it throws Herod into a spin. So if you look at sentence one uh, in the bulletin there, oh, we're told Jesus is born during the time of King Herod. Uh, in the Bible, you get a bit confused with kings named Herod. Uh, this Herod, the one up on the screen with no nose, he is the one called the Great. Uh, he's not the one around during the events of Easter. This Herod died not long after Jesus' birth. Uh, Herod the Great became king through military power. He rose to prominence in a time when Rome had lost control of Judea. The Parthians were occupying Judea, the land that is in our time again disputed, so Israel-Palestine. Herod, with the help of Rome, laid siege to Jerusalem and liberated Judea to once again be under Roman rule. Uh, in reality, Herod is king in name only. The real power is the Roman Empire. Herod rules at the pleasure of Caesar Augustus and his reign is tenuous. Herod constantly feels like power is slipping through his fingers and he's often violently desperate to maintain power. In the final years of his life, Herod arranges the murder of a number of his sons out of fear of their conspiracies and what might happen when he dies. Caesar Augustus is recorded saying he'd rather be Herod's pig than Herod's son. And so when Herod hears rumours of a newborn king of the Jews and he knows this child is not his, like so many rulers throughout history, at the mention of a political rival, a potential rival, he's thrown into a spin. So look with me at sentence number three. And when King Herod heard this, so he heard the new, heard of the king, new king of the Jews, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And so when he claims he wants to worship this child, it's no surprise it turns out a lie. And he, what he really wants to do is violently dispose of this threat. Uh, look at sentence seven. Uh, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Herod's power is tenuously held through violence. Uh, so it's no surprise he's anxious at word of an upstart king of the Jews. Herod is a picture of the fragility of human power. Uh, last week there were reports of Mark Zuckerberg's latest building project. Uh, Zuckerberg is the founder of Facebook, uh, the fifth wealthiest person on the planet, and he knows all your secrets. And if he couldn't get any more Bond villain-esque, he's building a secret compound complete with underground bunker on a Hawaiian island. Wealth, power, and enough fear to spend it burrowing underground. The baby born in Bethlehem is a threat to no one. He's a baby born into poverty in a little village away from the action, but despite his obvious weakness... The birth of Jesus makes Herod anxious. The birth of Jesus undermines all human power. 
His birth stands against those whose power comes from money or military. So that's the first king. A king like many others we see today. Herod's anxiety stands in stark contrast to the Magi. Uh, In sentence one, we're told about Magi who've come from the east. The Magi are probably not kings, as some Christmas carols claim, but they are linked to kingship. They're expert advisors to to the kings. Uh, The word Magi might make you think of magician, uh, but don't think magician like David Copperfield's illusions or Harry Potter's wands and potions. Kings, uh, sorry, Magi would advise kings by interpreting dreams and looking to the stars for omens. That's why Magi will have noticed uh, an astronomical event, a rising star or a a new comet in the sky, and responded to it. Uh, Three times we're told the Magi come from the east. For us, east means beach. But in biblical language, the east is where you're sent away from the presence of God. In Genesis 3, the man and woman are sent east of Eden. And so when these visitors come from a foreign land, when they come from the east, they are drawing near to God and his king. And we see this in their response to the star and their response to meeting Jesus. So sentence 9, after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What on, what on earth are they doing with these gifts? They're stupid gifts to give a child. Normally you give onesies or a soft toy, Not valuable gold and spices. Why these gifts? Uh, Some people think there's deep meaning in each of the three gifts. I'm not convinced. I reckon the significance is their value. They are paying tribute to a great king. Now, normally tribute is paid to get something in return. It's a political, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. We pay you tribute, then you don't come and kill us all. So why pay tribute to Jesus? This child born into poverty. When they get to the house, do you read it's a house they get to? It's not a palace. Why don't they just turn around? There's no king here. What do they think they're going to get in return to giving all of their treasures, gold and precious spices, to this kid born in poverty? Well, to answer that, we've got to look to the one person in this event who looks least like a king. Now, who is Jesus? The Magi believe he's the long-promised saviour king of Israel. So have a look again from the start. So this is sentence number one. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Uh, The mention of Bethlehem, uh, which was King David's hometown, and this mention of the king of the Jews, these two things remind us of God's ancient promises. For hundreds of years, Israel's prophets had been sounding a a promise, a promise that a descendant of David would rise to the throne, ushering in a new age of peace. These promises were based on the promise God gave to David a thousand years before Jesus was born, a promise that a descendant of David would continually reign. But for generations, this promise looks shaky. Until Jesus is born in Bethlehem, David's hometown. Now these magi, they come, because of the star, they come looking for a king. And they go to Jerusalem, the where you'd expect them to go, the capital city. They come to the attention of anxious King Herod. Herod gets advice from Jewish religious scholars who informs him, look, if you want to go looking for an infant king, if you're looking for the birthplace of a promised king, you don't look in Jerusalem, but Bethlehem. So look again at verse uh, sentence number four. Uh, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a a ruler 
who will shepherd my people Israel. Uh, The birthplace of the promised king of the Jews had been set about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. The prophet Micah said, Bethlehem would be the birthplace of the promised shepherd ruler of God's people. Uh, The word shepherd should get our attention. King David had literally been a shepherd. He wasn't born into a noble family. He was called out of the paddock and found himself wearing a crown. In ancient times, shepherds had the role, as the name says, of providing for their sheep. They would guide them to food and water. They would also protect their sheep from wild animals. So although shepherds were not opposed to using force, it was defensive. Micah's promise isn't a warrior king, but a shepherd king. In the ancient prophecy and in the infant born in Bethlehem, we meet someone very different from King Herod, which gets us back to that question, why give treasure to Jesus? He doesn't look like a king. He's got no apparent power. Have these magi lost the plot? Smelling too much of those spices, maybe. Now, I reckon it's because, although it's their astrology and and their expert minds that have led them to Jerusalem and to Herod, it's as they open the Jewish scriptures that they come to Jesus. And so they give them his, give, sorry, they give him their treasure because maybe they believe what God said through Micah, that the shepherd king born in Bethlehem will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. The one whose coming was written in the, in the skies would be the one whose rule and greatness reaches the whole earth. The baby born in Bethlehem would be the one to bring peace, not the anxiety-induced fake peace of Caesar or Herod, Peace inflicted at the point of the sword, but peace that will ultimately be achieved through Jesus being pierced by nails and a sword as he dies for his flock. Uh, Through the cross, God's greatest and promised son, the shepherd king who rules the whole earth, dies so we can come near to God. If you like, we can journey from the east to be with Jesus. So a question for us. This Christmas, as as you put on a paper crown at, at your Christmas table, how are you going to respond to the one born King of the Jews? Will you follow Herod and respond anxiously and maybe even with anger? We might not have the power of, of a Herod or a Zuckerberg, but in our own ways, many of the stories we tell ourselves are about power, power that Jesus undermines. We tell ourselves stories that we have power to define our identity or freedom to live however we like with no restrictions and often we tell ourselves these stories and we see these stories in actions because these are the things that get us angry when someone challenges our illusions to power like Herod we get anxious and then we get angry and Jesus does this doesn't he he challenges our own sense of power because he is the shepherd king and he makes a claim on our lives. He said, "He says, only I can lead and guide you. And so when we reject Jesus, we're rejecting God's king and God's rule and God's way. Is that the way you're going to respond to Jesus? With anxiety and anger? Or will you be like the Magi? Give him all your treasure because he is all you treasure. Will you turn and trust in him? Because only through him can you know peace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. That Jesus is your promised king, the one born to shepherd his people, to reign and rule over all the earth and to bring true and lasting peace. We thank you that Jesus' kingly rule is seen in his humble birth and his dying for his people. Help us see Jesus the one born in Bethlehem, as he really is. Help us see that in him is true kingship, true power, the only way for us to know eternal peace. And may we be like the Magi, giving all our treasure to Jesus, because he is all we treasure. Amen.